session, which is focusing on innovation for accessible tourism. This is day three for second Crit summer school, and we are at the last day. And I hope this session you will enjoy and listen to our great speakers. Moving forward, a quick guidelines for a participant. Uh, make sure you are prepared, your laptop is charged, be presentable when we are taking a group photo, chat responsibly and communicate with others if you want to do networking with other academics and be respectful to each other. For our q and session, we will take it at the end after the speaker sharing sessions. So we are taking your questions through Slido. You can scan the QR code here or our moderator assistant will post the direct link to post your questions. And please indicate which speaker your question is meant to be. So without further ado, let me introduce the moderator for this session. It's Associate Professor Dr. Camelia Meiki Kusumo it's from Taylor's University, and she will moderate this session for the innovation for accessible tourism. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Camelia. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rupam, uh, uh, for the introductions. So uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, nice actually to be here. Uh, okay, so for today, as you have seen, we will have uh, two speakers, uh, Professor Simon Darcy and uh, Dr. Trinidad Dominguez. So for as the first, the first speakers, I will introduce uh, 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 Professor Simon Dar Darcy first. So Simon Darcy is a professor of social inclusion at the UTS Business School, University of Technology, Sydney. Simon specializes in developing accessible and inclusive approaches to the involvement of people with disability across all areas of social participation and citizenship. In this session, Simon will examine the innovation and accessible tourism through addressing key consideration in developing a better normal for living with COVID-19 across the travel and tourism trip chain. This includes uh, information communication technology, travel agents, transport, accommodation, attraction, customer service, and developing an equality of experience for tourism products and services. Prof. Darcy will also examine the role of entrepreneurs with the disability in developing startups in the travel and tourism industry, where they believe that their insider understanding of the markets uh, allows them to respond to business opportunities that the non-disabled have not understood or overlooked. In doing so, they have created employment for themselves and others with disability, as well as providing innovative products and services to the growing accessible tourism market. So uh, now uh, let's, uh, without further ado, let's hear uh, the sharing of Professor Dr. Simon Darcy. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Camilla, Camilla for, your, for your introduction. Um, I just have to do some screen reorganization. Please bear with me. I am also, as well as being a professor, I am somebody with a lived experience of disability. I have a high level spinal cord injury and I use a power wheelchair and I uh, don't have uh, full dexterity in the hand. So I can just be a little slower in doing some of the tech stuff. And please give me the thumb. So please give me the thumbs up if you can now see um, a full screen. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm just getting uh, back onto, excellent, so there we go. Um, I, I also have, um, uh the live captioning working uh, down the bottom i do that as part of inclusive practice whether we have um, uh, people who require uh, captioning i find there are many advantages to uh, having the captioning there uh, so yeah i've, I've called uh, the session a better normal accessible and inclusive innovation across the travel chain i am uh i am delighted to be 
uh, co-presenting with uh, Trini Dominiguez, who uh, spent uh, time with me at the uh, uh, University of Technology Sydney North Shore campus for uh, a three-month period. Um, back in, I'll, I'll get uh, Trini to confirm it, the, the year later on, but 2012, uh, working on uh, the destination competitiveness and sustainability uh, framework for our 2015 paper in uh, tourism management that I have referenced at the end of um, uh, at the end of this presentation. So um, I will um, I will move forward on this uh, title slide. I'll just make a reference to the um, 17 sustainable uh, development goals. What I'll be largely talking about today is social sustainability. Uh, within the accessible uh, tourism area. Um, and I'll make some further comments as I move through. Um, I published a paper in 2010 that linked accessible tourism and sustainability um, way back then. And of course, now with the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, there's a series of um, sustainable development goals specifically uh, that uh, ad address requirements for people with disability, uh, particularly around uh, poverty, work, um, and uh, innovation and inclusive practice. So I will move on. So uh, six, uh, six areas, and I would appreciate just getting a uh, we've, we've got an extended time. Um, I can see a, 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 I've got a clock on screen, so I should be right with the timings. But I'm going to try and cover six areas. Just a general introduction and actually talk a little bit about myself. The importance of conceptualizing disability within the research framework, uh, which is next. Talk very uh, quickly about this simple concept of the travel chain and give some examples. I've just finished five years work on um, entrepreneurship and uh, or entrepreneurs with disability in Australia. Um, and uh, I've got some wonderful example of entrepreneurs coming out of uh, COVID who uh, have a disability and are working in the accessible tourism space. What is this idea of a better normal? Um, most people with disability don't want to go back to the way it was. Um, there's a, uh, there was a lot wrong and uh, COVID has actually brought about some changed practices, um, including uh, working from home, uh, which was something uh, some people with disability uh, would like as a reasonable accommodation. And there will there'll be some others. Um, and then just a conclusion where I you know, uh, look, look to the future, um, given uh, ongoing issues with travel at the moment. So um, who am I? Um, I'm the uh, person beside the uh, lady in the red jacket, who is my wife. And this uh, photo was taken and is a brilliant example of Spanish innovation, um, uh, a little north of Girona. And uh, as I said, I'm a power wheelchair user. I reversed into the basket in my power chair. I was transferred across onto a, like a racing car seat. And then that racing car seat was on a hydraulic elevation that took me up to about, um, five foot 10, five foot 11 in height. So I could see over the basket, just like anyone else that was in there. And it was a, I was the only person with a disability with Spanish um, and other international tourists. And that's a really important consideration in innovation. Too often people with disability are um, isolated within their tourist experience and uh, they have to have parallel services. So the, uh, the, the premise of universal design um, is an important one or innovative design. 
Um, and of course, this company was a wonderful example of um, entrepreneurial innovation in itself. So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, yes, I'm a professor now, but I wasn't always a professor. And in fact, at 19, I had a, uh, a spinal cord injury and I went from a world of uh, thinking I was on an elite sporting pathway uh, in, in a, a game called Rugby Union. Um, and uh, that changed very quickly. So I, I started to get find my new life uh, through doing volunteer advocacy work. Um, I uh, went back to university where I was doing a teaching degree and changed that to an arts degree and then did a master's of environmental planning. I worked as a consultant. I was one of the first uh, access auditors uh, in Australia and matched that with my planning consultancy and did a lot of work around um, venues and events and improving access. I stumbled back into the university environment and belatedly completed a PhD. And um, I've got quite a portfolio of research um, authorship uh, but very importantly, um, I don't see research as an end. I see research as a starting framework for bringing about social change. So the very last bullet point, uh, two, two bullet points, policy, advi uh, policy advisor to bring about change. And secondly, I was also vice president of what's called the um, uh, Association of Consultants in Access Australia. So uh, a professional organisation Australia-wide that work within ma uh, major projects um, in making sure access and inclusion uh, considerations under our national construction code are included. Um, that, of course, cuts across all areas of tourism. So um, that's hot air ballooning, fantastic experience. Um, this isn't me, but this is a person called Jezza Williams in New Zealand, who um, is a little, uh, a very similar sort of disability to myself um, and doing uh, paragliding. But as you can see in a modified, uh, uh, in a modified vehicle that allows him to land safely. So first thing to learn is disability is not homogenous. So I'll, there are different types of disability, um, mobility, vision, or blind, a person being blind, a person being hearing impaired or deaf, uh, those people with uh, intellectual disability or on the uh, autism spectrum people with mental health issues and others. Um, now, so just keep that in mind when we're talking through today. So there's, um, uh, this is called, uh, this slide's called conceptualizing disability. And I, I um, ask researchers to really specify how you define disability in your research work. Too much shoddy work is being done and being published in journals that does not clearly define either um, uh, for empirical purposes or conceptual purposes, what broad framework or model they are using. So the medical model, for example, um, sees uh, anyone's impairment equated to a deficit and their disability, where uh, the person with a disability is seen as being a victim and having a personal tragedy. And uh, disability is not like illness. Uh, all people with disability may get ill, uh, but that's a health state that they temporarily pass through. Um, and then 
uh, most of their lives uh, carry on within the, uh, their uh, disabled embodiment. So social models of disability have a very different understanding of impairment and disability. Um, in, uh, a person's impairment is not their disability. The disability are the structural elements of a society, economically, politically, environmentally, attitudinally, that disable that individual from social participation. So two models, there's another model around embodied understandings. So think about the five senses and the different types of embodied experience that come through um, uh, sight, for example, uh, and Uri and the tourist gaze is a wonderful conceptualization of. Tourism as driven by seeing and sightseeing, and it's so ingrained, but a person who is blind has their own experiences of tourism um, that are uh, perceived through uh, tactility. Um, they're perceived through uh, the ambience of the area that they're in, the taste of food and wine, the music, the movement of the body, et cetera, et cetera. In just the same way as Jezza Williams is having a different sense in the experience that he's undertaking in New Zealand, all people with disability, depending on their type of disability, have different embodied understandings. And lastly, and there are many other models, but the other model is a human rights model. And this is really important, the human rights model, because while prior to 2006, many countries had their own uh, Disability Discrimination Act or anti-discrimination around disability. Uh, in 2006, we had a uh, introduction of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. That just, uh, I had a look at the uh, countries people were coming from, from the presenters list. And uh, all of those countries that I could see that are here today are signatories of this convention and must report on it. Now I'm uh, uh, I'm just going to touch on some of the key uh, the key underlying values: respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, including the freedom for people to make their own choices, non discrimination, full and effective participation in society, respect for difference and acceptance of person with uh, disabilities as part of human diversity. So not separate from it, uh, that uh, all people should have an equal opportunity to uh, areas of citizenship. Accessibility, I will talk more about in a moment. Uh, quality between men, women and children uh, who have disability um, and a underlying dignity to the engagements they have in society. So the convention has um, somewhere around 40 articles. I'm just gonna pick up on four articles and uh, mention some aspects of uh, innovation. So first off is personal mobility. So um, those signatories uh, must take effective measures to ensure the personal mobility with the greatest possible independence for people. So I'll just mention a, a few things. So the person who's blind or vision impaired, their personal mobility may be assisted by having uh, a stick and a cane to help their uh, wayfinding or a guide dog. And uh, in certainly in different parts of the world, they're uh, very important. Um, and of course, there are many other mobility aids, devices, assistive tech 
and uh, other forms of um, uh, other forms of technology that assist personal mobility. Now, the picture that's on the screen, um, there are different names for them in different parts of the world. Uh, this one was called Trekkie. This is actually me in the ancient city of Rome uh, with um, a company called Rome and Italy Tours. I think that was also um, uh, back in 2012 as well on my first trip to Italy. And what they were able to do um, with this innovative piece of mobility technology was to get me to uh, that part of ancient Rome where Julius Caesar was stabbed on the Ides of March. So as a, as a high school student studying ancient history, I always have wanted to see this. I would never have seen it with my power wheelchair. So another form of innovation in technology, but mixed with interpretation services of the um, wonderful tour guide and the two strapping lads that assisted in getting through that ancient site. Accessibility is more than the physical environment. It also includes transport. So I'm just using a, a, a particular uh, vessel here, boat. Uh, but really importantly, and Trini is picking up on this in the next presentation, um, is information and communication technologies. Most of us plan uh, via the internet. We use all sorts of smart apps. We're hooking into the development of smart city environments and finding out about where you're going to go and planning a trip and then wayfinding around these environments is so much easier than it used to be. So those three elements of accessibility are so important. Um, and uh, there have been some real challenges and disruption, not just through COVID, but what I would call a platform capitalism, such as Uber and Airbnb, who have um, disregarded the legislation and the convention by not having adequate levels of disability accessibility across all those dimensions of access. Um, and in particular, um, across those trying to plan through websites or simply um, not having adequate rolling stock or Airbnb that is identified as being accessible. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a major challenge for those of us trying to plan trips when these disruptions have uh, got around regulated environments. So the last uh, two, uh, two elements, and I put them together, and I like putting them together, uh, some people don't live to work, they work to live. And so I've called this live, work, play and travel. So work and employment are so important because people with disability have high levels of unemployment and um, high levels of unemployment, high levels of poverty. And tourism is largely a market-driven uh, market industry with some social tourism opportunities, predominantly in uh, rich, uh, developed, resource-rich countries. So um, the employment rates vary tremendously uh, in those areas where we've actually got uh, good data. Uh, you know, for example, the EU um, and uh, some uh, areas of Latin America um, some areas of Asia um, and Australasia as well. Article 30 is all about tourism and uh, also includes the arts, sport, recreation, etc. So I wanted to give you that introduction because as signatory countries, we should be doing a lot more to be more accessible and inclusive. But even in countries where you would expect 
there are problems and problems have arisen at different times. So um, this building is the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Center. And it became um, the site of a big court action in Australia in the um, early 1990s when the building was to be built without access for people with disability coming through the front entrance. And we can see the steps that are there um, and there are all sorts of issues that have arisen. And people with disability would have to go around to the back um, and then get access. So it was a form of segregation. And uh, Kevin Cox challenged this under the Australian, uh, actually Queensland law, um, to make sure that it had to be redesigned with an access option up the side of the building. So that was a landmark case um, in the Australian context. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip on some water. So you need enabling environments for accessibility, but something even more important, positive attitudes of all stakeholders involved in tourism. Of all stakeholders involved in tourism. And we see that attitude is one of the uh, biggest issues to get over um, in, uh, in, in the space. And there's some very good uh, research publications around this area. So I just want to come back to um, uh, a definition of accessible tourism that draws a little bit on what I had just said then. So accessible tourism is a form of tourism that involves collaborative processes between stakeholders that allow people with access requirements, including mobility, vision, hearing, and cognitive dimensions of access to function, and this is very much drawn out of the UN Convention, um, independently and with equity and dignity through the delivery of universally designed, I won't have time to go through universal design today, uh, tourism products, services, and environments. This definition adopts a whole of life approach. People at different times during their life uh, there are different rates of disability. And as we get older, the, those rates of disability increase. And if you think about your own families, I'm sure you've got examples. Uh, so this includes uh, people with permanent temporary disability, seniors, those who are obese, people with um, families with young children and those beneficiaries are also uh, universally designed uh, products and services a safer and more socially sustainable. So on the right-hand side, um, there was a document put out uh, uh, back, in, uh, uh, back in 2021, Accessibility and Inclusive Tourism Development in Nature Areas, which I was um, very, uh, very honored to be part of and wrote the conclusion to uh, that shows that even people with high-level mobility disability uh, are able to get wonderful opportunities when they're thought, planned and designed. And not to do so is not being socially sustainable. It's inappropriate, inappropriate, ineffective and inefficient in uh, creating environments not to be inclusive of these groups. Um, and yeah, actually in the uh, outdoor areas, we also talk about uh, the individual taking on responsibility to do activities by challenging by choice. So there are inherent risks uh, associated with some activities. I just want to touch on um, some different types of travel and what we know about the inclusion of people with disability compared to the non-disabled. For some reason, my um, my legend didn't come up. So the blue is disability, the red is non-disabled. And the first, oh, because of my um, captioning, you can't see down the bottom. 
on the left is day trips. And so people with disability actually, based on Australian national figures, have approximately the same level of travel as non-disabled. In this year, it was plus 2%. But when travel goes to overnight and more planning is required, there's a uh, travel deficit of minus 23% between people with disability and the non-disabled. And so that's telling us something about the complexity when they've got to stay away from home, uh, obvious reasons around transport and accommodation. And it's even worse for people with disability traveling overseas. So that, that, um, that travel deficit goes to um, minus 49. That means people with disability travel almost 50% less uh, in going overseas. So that tells us that the uh, information systems that Trini are going to talk about, there's some real problems. So I'm going to go for about another 10 minutes or so um, just to finish up on uh, some ideas. So the travel chain is a useful and simple concept, and it refers to all elements that make up a journey from a starting point uh, of a destination, including the pedestrian access, vehicles, transfer points. If any link is inaccessible, the entire trip becomes difficult for people with disability. And that was from a uh, WHO, World Health and World Bank report in 2011. And it's everybody's job from information search, home to community, community to regional transport interchanges, right across all sectors of the industry, um, accommodation, aid, travel agents, um, attractions, hospitality, destination management, promotion coordinators to make sure they're doing as good a job as possible to make these travel chains work. Um, and of course, airline flight at the moment, I'll touch on that in a moment, has been highly problematic since um, coming out of COVID because of um, a massive shortage of staff that had been trained in this area beforehand that are no longer in the industry. And of course, traveling away. So I'm gonna give a really quick, simple, uh, example of um, what's required to have a continuous pathway. So this map, and this is my house, and this is my local taverna, uh, pub or hotel, and it's 1.4 kilometers, and there didn't used to be a footpath. And that meant I couldn't travel independently. Simple mobility issue. So working together with the local uh, local government, I was able to um, improve the accessibility of this. It allows me to independently go to, uh, you know, what is effectively a community meeting place. Uh, but after uh, access was improved. In that very, in that 1.4, um, in that 1.4 kilometers, there are um, there are also a um, German school, a swim center, a Catholic church, a Buddhist temple, a major um, uh, a major convention center, um, and the what we noticed afterwards was. Uh, we saw lots of families and prams using the pathway. We've got joggers. We've got all sorts of foot traffic now with a safe way to be able to get to all these places of participation. So good access for the community is good access for people with disability as well. And there are beneficiaries. Now, in a travel sense, I'm just going to show you all these dot points. Every one of these dot points is a, um, is a link in the travel chain. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. To allow me to travel from Sydney to Townsville, about 3,000 kilometres away. For me to undertake the experience I wanted to uh, be involved in. And that was uh, fishing off Magnetic Island and being able to um, catch a... Uh, that's a coral trout, very, uh, very um, highly sought after fish. But the boat I'm on uh, had to, you know, had to be an accessible boat. And uh, they're not always that easy to um, find. So again, an entrepreneur who saw access as a business opportunity. And I already spoke about two others. And um, uh, so personal mobility, mobility on the water. And when you, when you look at that in context to all the different disability types, uh, there's a lot that businesses can do to leverage off disability. And in, in the Australian figures, the 3.4 people who travel with them uh, when they are uh, going on an overnight, uh, an overnight trip locally or an overseas trip. And I've just got some observations on um, a few areas just before we finish up. So innovation and entrepreneurship um, has been um, blossoming in Australia uh, since 2015 with respect to um, the dis different disability market. The reason for this is a revolutionary social program called the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme that provides a form of individualized funding to people with disability for their support needs and also includes sport, recreation and tourism uh, for the most high and very high levels of support needs. So of the 4 million people with disability in Australia, about, uh, about 500,000 people are funded under this scheme. And what we've seen is um, and this photo on the right um, only occurred um, earlier this week, and that was Tourism Australia co-designing, uh, doing some co-design work with entrepreneurs with disability, all these people around the table, who are servicing the tourism sector with small startup businesses based on a series of technologies um, and service provision um, that have um, developed partly, not wholly, but partly because the market has changed since 2015. So there's this explosion of innovation and entrepreneurship. So we're seeing all sorts of businesses, new accommodations, uh, new experiences uh, being uh, being developed. And it very simply, people with disability, and this came out of research I did, just want to do cool things without the hassle. And I'm just going to touch on a few of those before I finish. So this, and it should play, this is an experience I did in New Zealand in 2019. Yes, they are sharks. And um, in order to get to this um, uh, sustainable, eco-friendly shark feeding experience required an innovation in boat, uh, not in the boat design, but in the temporary um, ramping system used to get on. And this is me uh, about to go up and get on the on the boat to go out to um, to go out to the uh, to the shark feeding. Now that's because, and sorry, he's uh, Tom is just here. He's kneeling down fixing up the ram. Um, he had experience with disability and wanted to make sure that his business could take as many people um, as possible. Now, um, 
Another experience I was able to have in New Zealand was to get up onto a glacier in a helicopter. And again, a Jezza Williams put me in contact with this company and they, uh, uh, they regularly took wheelchair chair users up and a uh, fantastic experience. We went all the way down into Milford Sound, but you required a, uh, a company who were innovative and solution finders but also i was able to use my chair which raises that brought me up to the level of the seat in the back seat of the helicopter and the uh, males that are there are um, with the company i uh, apart from traveling with my uh, my wife i also travel with a helper and absolutely wonderful experience and of course then COVID hit um, so I, I just finishing with a few others uh, around innovation. Innovation is also about policies, procedures, and including people with disability, even in the biggest events. This is Sydney, New Year's Eve. And I can tell anyone with a disability that's listening, if you want to come to Sydney, you will have a spectacular experience on New Year's Eve in a series of locations that have been integrated into um, a massive event with about a million people at the harbour for the New Year's Eve. So innovation comes in many uh, technology, etc., but also policies and procedures. It is also about logistics. This is, it doesn't look at the highest point in Australia, Mount Kosciuszko, and this was a mixed ability group that were able to get up um, on, a, on a trek for the first time to the base, including people with mobility, vision, uh, parents with young children, et cetera. But it took a concerted effort working with a series of organizations to bring that about. So to finish, the road to recovery. We don't want the, we don't want to go back to the way things were. We want to hit a reset button that makes things better than the way they were. So what can help? Well, two documents, one by the uh, UNWTO that identifies some uh, post-COVID uh, strategies that you can put in place for business planning. And also the World Travel and Tourism Council came out with a, an excellent guide to developing inclusive and accessible systems, creating safe spaces and designing and engaging relevant systems that exemplify inclusion and access. However, at the moment, we know that flying is still highly problematic. The picture there is um, unassigned luggage at Heathrow ha Airport from a few weeks ago. And this is highly problematic for people with disability who might be traveling with um, supplies that they require for um, uh, their daily living or um, medically. And lastly, uh, there's been an upsurge in uh, damaged equipment, uh, damaged equipment. So it's gonna take some time to um, get the systems operating again because of the loss of expertise in the area. So how do we get uh, an industry cultural change so that uh, it's more attuned to access and inclusion? Well, that starts with everybody at the local level because good local areas make great places to holiday. But to do that requires strategic change. And I'll be handing over to um, Trini to now talk about the systems that need to be in place in um, websites and planning at the national destination level. And if we get it right, we will uh, welcome everyone for a better normal than we had before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Simon for the great yeah. presentation, for sharing also your own personal experience uh, in the accessibility 
Okay, now um, uh, I would like actually to introduce uh, uh, so uh, uh, then our next uh, sp speaker, Dr. Trinidad Dominguez. Uh, she is a professor of business management and marketing at the Faculty of Business Sciences and Tourism and the Faculty of Computing Science, University of Figo, Spain. Her research activity is focused on the area of tourism marketing for people with disability and elderly people, the, relig the relationship between both and the relationship with the new technologies. So in this uh, summer school, uh, today Trini will examine the innovation in accessible tourism through a content analysis of information about accessibility and disability provided in the official tourism websites. Specifically, uh, taking into account the information available for people with the disabilities in the official tourism website, a comparison between the European, Asian and Ocean countries is going to be made. The objective is to establish the areas where there is a greater or lesser presence of information, as well as its quality in different uh, phases of the travel and tourism trip information chains. So let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Trini, who will present uh, accessibility and disability information in tourism websites, real or fictions. So Dr. Trini, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, good morning. Here in Spain is uh, close to nine <laughs> in the morning. I would I would like to thank the organizers committee for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me to stay here. Well, with a computer, but to stay here. But one of the best to me is share this time with Simon. He is a reference as as a researcher and as a person. Uh, Simon uh, focus uh, the uh, her his presentation uh, since a personal point of view. I go to I go to try to complete this this uh, topic, but then uh, since a technical view. Okay, I go to uh, speak about the tourist nowadays, the beneficiaries, the barriers the website, the comparison in the different areas, and then to finish the presentation with the conclusions. Uh, the emergence of the COVID at the end of 2019 uh, transformed the lives of people around the world. Uh, the economic and the social repercussions of the pandemic uh, are numerous, but one of the set of most, most affected was tourists. Uh, the World Children's Organization estimate that in 2020, the number of international tourists fell by 98%, with a year-on-year -year decrease of 56%, and the economic losses suffered were three times more than in the 2009 economic crisis. Subsequently, the set of grey grew growth, sorry, by 4% in 2021, but did not fully record until this year, with a year-on-year -year increase of mm, close to 200%. For other way, the digitalization of the customer company's relationship continued, and the pandemic accelerated this trend. There was a clear increase in data traffic and in line for charge for consumer goods. As an example, annual data traffic or why increased over the pandemic between 13 and almost of 30 percent, with most countries doubling, doubling their data use. This trend continues today. In the similar way, in the tourist sector uh, goes to the e-commerce. In 2020, 38% of internet user searches on the network for websites relating to tourist destination, travel, and holidays. And at the beginning of this year, the e-commerce linked to the tourist service had increased across the board. For instance, uh, car rental increased more than 15%, uh, apartments and tourist house 13 
but um, I don't know, a Pukat's holy base, 60%. Deterrence is very important for economies, and one of the seconds, the segments, sorry, with great relevance nowadays in the tourist market are the beneficiaries of accessibility. It is estimated that over 50% of world population has a disability, and this data will increase for 1,000 million people today to 1,200 million in 2050. And then the adding of the global population will exacerbate this effect, as there is a clear relationship between disability and aging. 35% of people over 65 years have some uh, from a form of disability. And the World Health Organization expects that by 2050, the number of people over 60 years of age will double, reaching 2.1 billion, that in two, <clears throat> sorry, 2,100 could reach 3 billion. Uh, it is therefore possible to estimate, estimate yeah, that about one fifth of the world's population require measures to ensure accessibility. Um, a potential market in Europe uh, is about uh, 260 million beneficiaries of accessibility. Because as says Simon, accessibility is for everybody, for people with disabilities, okay? But for elder people, for pregnant women, for families with children, that is my case. The basis on this that the market opportunity they represent for the tourist sector is very important, but tourists provide have generally not, take, uh, not taking account of this group, even less, even less so in the private sector, which does not normally take measures of initiatives without legal compulsion. This situation is aggravated by the fact that the group of people with disability is usually treated as homogeneous, with no account being taken of their very different conditions and needs. One of these consequences are the barriers to travel. As Simon explained, as a, a expert in, in accessibility, as a user with a disability, the barriers are a lot when travel. One of the, my, the main barriers that people with disability incur, uh, encounter when traveling is the access to the information. Tourists and visitors with disability need more information when planning their trip because they need sure about a lot of different things. Specifically, 30% have indicated that one of the main barriers they face is the accuracy of information, in particular, information about accessibility. In the around 50% have indicated that they will travel more, they won't travel, but the problem is that they don't feel sure about the access to the facilities. That is why family, friends, and associations continue to be the main information source, although the internet has gained great importance in the recent years, particularly among groups with uh, physical disabilities. Online tools such as uh, websites uh, have become a key, uh, a key, sorry, a key element for the promotion of destination, and have established uh, themselves as the most important communication channel nowadays. A proof of the importance of this tool for people with difficulties in accessing information online is that, okay, 70, around 70% 70 of tourists with disabilities use internet-based service, but 
only 11% make online bookings because they don't have uh, all the information that they need or they know, uh, are not sure about the quality of the information. Again, the problem is the barrier to access to, oh, uh, sorry, to access online information. The World Tourism Organization has identified two major barriers to access information. The first derives uh, the, uh, the rise from the characteristics of communication system, okay? The hardware on the software, that is the accessibility to the web. When I turn on my computer and open my browser, this what is the problem? I can access to the website, I can I understand the message. In this context, some studies, almost very recent, five years ago, no more, have examined different tourist activities covering a large, part, a large part of the travel information chain. From these studies, it can be concluded that although many organizations, both public and private, make great efforts to offer accessible websites and that the relevant regulation and give lanes exist, too many tourist agents still need to rethink their accessibility strategies, mainly in relation to the compatibility of assistive technologies with the navigation, with the compatibilization and the adaptation and alternatives to text. Okay, it's great uh, the use uh, pictures, use videos, but there are a lot of people that can see these pictures or uh, can access these videos. We need other way to understand, to, to communicate this information. The second barrier relates to the informational, informational content. Yes, when I open this web page. What is the information about, about accessibility, about disability, about where, where is exist, no where exist? A few studies have been undertaken to uh, accessibility of information for people with disability in tourist website. For this reason, uh, we think, Simon and me, that is uh, very important uh, research in this way, because website, websites now play a deficit role as a provider of information about destination, offering all the potential tools might want to find. And this is where destination marketing organization can take a leading role as destination manager, as marketers, as advocates, researchers, partners, and as economic catalysts. Websites have been seen the ball from more destination marketing organizations have assumed an increasingly important role. Using internet as a source of tourist, uh, of tourist information, they can strengthen destination, image, and brands. When we go to travel, the first things that we, we, we do is go to internet always to find information about the destination, to, to see pictures, videos, opinions, reviews. Internet now is the focus when planning or, 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 or travel trip. Um, as uh, I say at the first, the objective of this research is to analyze the information on accessibility available on official tourist websites to different countries of Europe, Asia, and Pacific. For uh, get this, we use uh, different keywords like disabled, disability, accessible, accessibility, and accessible tourists, and some, sometimes a uh, handicap and perplexity. And then with these words, uh, to two methods were used to conduct the, the search. If the website it has it had its own search engine, it was used. Go to engine 
and write the words and then analyze the results. And if no, the researchers browses the website tabs and use the search engine, engine of the internet browser, in our case, a Google Chrome. We classificate the results, the results in two different blocks of variables. And the first is about the type of accessible information. Uh, for this, we follow the criteria on the World Tourism Organization that say that the accessible information uh, ha have to uh, uh, follow a, 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 um, a main principle. Credibility, visibility, adaptness, correctness, and completeness. And then uh, we uh, classify in the, another block the information uh, following the elements of the tourism accessibility chain. Mm -hmm. We have the type of information and the typology. Now you can see in this. Okay. For the type of information, we try to understand the quality, quantity, the search facilities, and the level of web accessibility yes, uh, with the different sub variables. And about the resource of information, we classify following the, the, the accessibility chain for service, okay? The, mm, the most important when we, we travel, that is accommodation, transport, healthcare, and similar. Then in cultural and regional, uh, recreational activities like uh, shopping, cinema, uh, specific events. And finally, in tourist attractions. That is very important because we travel a destination because we want to see something. And we use general information, beach, lakes, heritage, and similar. And now the results. The results are very exceptional, but we will start. The first step was to identify the main terms to use to search for information on the web. We want to understand or we want to clarify when what, um, what is the most important words when we have to find information about accessibility. Uh, so uh, for Europe, we have uh, around uh, 34,000 uh, results. And for the area Asia and Pacific, around 50,000 results. Uh, in Europe, more than 40% of the results provide useful uh, information. It, it is specific information about accessibility because you can uh, uh, have a lot of results when you find in the search, but then this information is uh, it's no useful. In the Asia and Pacific area, this is this case uh, of the more than uh, 50,000 results, only 7.7% is uh, provide useful information. Uh, this di disparity is because in Asia and Pacific, almost 50% of the outputs were based on the use of the keyword accessible, which is employed there in fields and relation to disability. For Europe, as you can see in the graphic, Accessible and accessibility were the search term with the highest outputs. This is an indication that very often the search for accessible tourists produce many results because it so out the words separately. You have a lot of results, but result for accessible and result for tourists, but not for accessible tourists. Specifically, Websites that return high number of outputs in Europe were first, first sorry, Portugal, followed follow by Slovakia, Sweden, and Norway. Uh, particularly for uh, the words disability, accessible, and accessibility. Although this does not necessarily 
imply that these sites contain the most useful information, as we can say later. In the ASEAN Pacific region, sites in Australia, New Zealand, and Thailand were notable for the use of the term accessible children. But if we analyze the travel, uh, the travel information chain, okay, about the information of the resource for Europe and Asia Pacific shows that the most focus uh, is put on information about accommodation, accommodation, which represent 33% in Europe and 35% in Asia and Pacific, with a total of uh, results more or less in Europe, uh, more than 8,000 results in all websites of all the countries, and in Asia Pacific region, more than 5,000. Then in Europe, uh, these results was followed by foods and beverages and heritage and tourist sites with one, more than 1,700 uh, uh, for food and beverage and for heritage and tourist sites with 1,500. Important, there are a lot of resources very important that uh, have a, a very poor result. In Europe, for instance, travel agencies for tourists with disabilities only have two results in more than 30 countries, two results. In the Asia Pacific region, the sequence was different. Accommodation um, being followed by roads and tours with more of uh, 1,400 results and then heritage and tourist sites. The reminder of elements provide uh, have uh, less than 65 results. But now we want to try to speak some, about something positive, the good examples of websites, okay? Uh, the countries with the best uh, uh, with the best websites uh, with best results in Europe are uh, Germany, uh, Portugal, Sweden, and United Kingdom. And for Asia and Pacific region, we have Australia, Japan, and New Zealand. And now, uh, briefly review some of these highlights: their uh, strengths and weaknesses of these websites. We start with Germany. This is the website, okay? Although it's search engine don't know provide of com data, hence the low number of results. Uh, Germany don't have a lot of results when you, you use the, the search. In the general information section, uh, a link lists all the available results. You have a accessible tools resort as a link. These sites provide the highest quality of information by having homogenized initial criteria and because it uh, differentiate, differentiate, differentiates uh, sorry, according to typology because one of the problems is uh, a lot of information is uh, focused on mobility and people with uh, uh, mobility problems or general information. Mm -hmm. It has a weakness in that is where it refers visitors to the site, to the website of the various destination. You have to find information in a different links. The next is Portugal. Portugal is another good example. Uh, the site provides the most information about the different types of elements of travel information chain. You can see here, you have a lot of uh, uh, information for the different tip, uh, elements of, of, the, of the travel chain. Uh, uh, the unique uh, uh, strength, thing, strength thing is that in the filters you have uh, it's not very clear because um, 
you have different results between if you use accessible as a filter or if you use disable access. It's no, uh, it's no clear the results. No? It takes into account disability type, but mainly only for accommodation. The rest of the resource is a general information. Sweden's site includes, includes a specific and almost inexhaustible, incredible. I, I spent a lot of time uh, um, researching this, this website. Um, it's an inexhaustible search engine for children's resources themselves and for others of secondary or complementary nature. The quality of this information provided is as good as in the German case. Also, differentiation according to the disability types. The only problem, the only, only, only problem that I can find is that the subcategories that you can see here of the search engine are in the Swedish language. Although later the information can be accessed in several languages, but this menu is in Swedish language. The U, United, uh, sorry, the UK case is similar to the Swedish in terms of its specific search engine quality and quantity, but it has the disadvantage that a lot of information is repeat during the search of the different uh, elements of the travel chain. Australia is a great reference for Asia and Pacific region. The site provides a lot of information on accessibility, taking into account of typologies. But, because always there is a but, as the information is accessed through a offerance on link, the information is very variable because it's, need, it's not homogeneous. Because when you link in the information, you go to the domain of the offering, for instance, to the hotel um, beach, but you go other link and go to the hotel mountain. And they don't have the same standard to show the information. Uh, for us, it's a great weak point. Oh, sorry. A New Zealand site provides a link to another site with a different domain, but although the, the amount of information is good in comparison to other websites, the information is of low quality and different disability types are not taken, in a, a, taken into account. And finally, um, very important, the Japanese site don't offer as much information as in Australia case, but the quality is much higher. Uh, the level of information provided is among the best. The best is a great example to follow uh, is, uh, in the both website that they use. Uh, you have a lot of pictures, but you have uh, a tables with all of measures, with all the things, and they consider all typologies of disability. As a conclusion, I want to highlight the accessibility must be understood in a global way, as uh, if there is a discontinuity in elements of the travel information chain and the relationship with, between them, they will become accessible resource, but in accessible environments. It is important to create some uh, simple idea, door to door information, okay? As have been uh, observed, this is not true for most websites, which seems uh, to be limited in their quantity and quality of information and by the variety of information or for all links in the accessible tourist chain. It is obvious that tourists agents continue to fail to provide a current information about specific requirements. Focusing, focusing more on general and general advice like hotel access is accessible. Information, nothing else. Finally, I want to highlight 
again, the Japanese website as I'm set up to follow. And now, thank you for your attention, and I hope that you enjoy this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Trinidad. Uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, the research is very uh, comprehensive. Uh, the data that you have collected is amazing. So, uh, yes, I think, I think your uh, presentation really complemented uh, the presentation of Prof. Uh, uh, Simon's uh, earlier uh, regarding the accessibility. So, if uh, Prof. Simon actually uh, focused a lot on the access physic uh, in terms of physical accessibility, you're focusing more in terms of the uh, digital uh, or information accessibility for people with disabilities. Okay, uh, I see there are quite some uh, questions in the, from the, the audience. I think, I think I will try actually to go through. I hope that we have uh, enough time uh, to go through all questions because I think your presentation is uh, uh, very, very interesting. I think, and uh, I will just go through the first question uh, to Professor Simon first. So uh, question number one. Uh, what is expected from all concerns bodies, especially from WTO and UNWTO and others regarding to development of tourism which invite uh, uh, disabilities, uh, specifically about the policy formulated for accessibility for those people uh, uh, with disabilities? Yeah, it's actually a very good time to be talking about that as a question because the International Standard Organization now has an uh, accessible tourism for all guideline that provides some really uh, important uh, detail like Trini was talking about with respect to uh, provisions in destination regions. So um, it's, a, it's a very good global approach to um, understanding the uh, requirements for uh, businesses. Um, the uh, UNWTO puts together some uh, good practice, best practice examples like the natural areas one that they put out actually in uh, four, four volumes in 2015 um, that again provide uh, uh, some excellent guidelines. Um, but the, uh, the, the way that these become implemented by nation states is highly variable um, and uh, you know so for example um, Hong Kong uh, uses a uses the same standard as Australia and New Zealand uh, and uh, so you've got some uh, very uh, some very interesting approaches in um, in that part of uh, Asia but it's done very differently on mainland China so uh, the, 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 the way that it becomes implemented um, is very different depending on the national building codes, construction codes uh, of each of the nation states. Yes, uh, I, I do agree on that. Uh, even in Malaysia, uh, uh, in every state, the Malaysia have actually different uh, building codes. <laughs> so, so sometimes these uh, 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 the, the bylaws regarding universal designs are so quite different from states to state, even in Malaysia itself. Yeah, Singapore uh, is another excellent example. Yes. yes. Uh, much smaller area, but of course, uh, but they, they do very well um, on the implementation of those various construction codes and a lot of universal design principles, particularly in their transport, uh, metro systems, etc. like Hong Kong also has excellent transport in that space as well. Yes, 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 agree. All right, uh, let's move on to the next question. This is uh, one uh, participant from Ethiopia. Uh, he said that my country experienced no institution of tourism considered accessibility of disabilities around tourist destination. So how to overcome and what is your recommendation as a professional in this matter? One, uh, one quick one. Uh, check to see if you are a signatory country on the mm -hmm. UN Convention. And if you are a signatory country, your government has responsibilities and your advocacy sector 
should point these out because it is um, embarrassing for countries to report that they are not uh, contributing in this area. Ah, okay, I, I, I think I think that is a, a good point. So uh, I think uh, the, to check also the participatory as well, whether, whether your, the country is a signatory country of UN conventions. Okay, the next question, also to Professor Simons, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about the current state accessibility in hotels and accommodation? Are there any good models to follow? Are there examples that you can mention? Oh, I think Trini just gave you a, a good model with the Japanese yes. uh, example. Um, and I put a little note in the window when Trini was talking. Um, you do have these improvements, very uh, unfortunately for Tokyo, um, that pop up around the Olympics and the Paralympics. So they changed it, it's just as in Spain, Barcelona did a, a, an amazing job for the um, Olympics and Paralympics. Sydney, London, they all go through revolutions of change around some of these areas as well. So uh, I'm not sure why Tokyo improved so well, but that may be one of the reasons because it used to be very difficult to get information out of Tokyo. Okay, so, so do you, you think that due, because of the Paralympics was uh, organized or taking place in these places, that these places or the local government actually started to improve their accessibility? Uh, definitely. <laughs> All right. So maybe we just have to encourage actually this Paralympics uh, 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 event has to be taken, has to take place all over, keep moving, well, so more places actually be, become more accessible. Well, remember, there's regional games as well. So the, you know, yes. the ASEAN countries, for example, used uh, Singapore and they actually used the, uh, oh, what's the, the, the big hotel there um, that's right on the foreshore? Three mm -hmm. Towers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that became the village. That, you know, the big, uh, very important five-star hotel. Uh, very good accessibility features. So they, they use that for the Asian games. Yeah. Trini must have more examples. Yes, maybe Dr. Trini, can you mention a bit more examples? Uh, as Simon said, in Spain was very similar. One was the in Barcelona, the Olympic ah, Games yes. with the Paralympic Games. But uh, the problem is uh, uh, we need something event or something important for the country for that the government and public sector, very important public sector, change the model. We need always events. Mm. events. Is, this is the, the, the way the countries with great accessibility was because Japan had the Olympic Games and similar events. Mm, yeah. there, is a, there is another question. Uh, who actually plays a bigger part in this uh, uh, accessibility? The government or the people in the tourism industry? What do you think? <laughs> I think both <laughs> they have to play a role. I, I think as you mentioned, I think the public sector uh, is also a very, yeah, I think especially the government for the public sectors is very important. However, this has to be responded as well by the, the private sectors in the tourism industry. Uh, okay. And that is uh, maybe, uh, let, let's move on to the next uh, question also. Maybe this is for Dr. Trini. Along with physical issue, don't you think psychological issue are to be given importance while addressing accessibility? Yeah, this is uh, the problem that I try to highlight in the presentation that uh, the information is focused on uh, people with mm, mobility, with uh, physical disabilities, and they, uh, the parents now consider uh, the different typologies and needs of disability. And this is the, another important problem. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, personally, I, I also uh, uh, um, uh, wonder, um, and other things, I mean, looking at the example that both of you actually presented and also like the best countries with the best information for accessibility, most of them 
are uh, 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 high income countries. So I'm just wondering, um, uh, is there any alternative for the countries that have less, uh, uh, less rich, that, that are less rich actually than the examples that actually you have shown? Because uh, of course the accessibility is not the cheap infrastructure. It requires quite some inf investment in terms of the infrastructures. Uh, and many of the countries or the, the, the public sector doesn't have in fact the capability to finance this kind of uh, projects. Yes, but okay, you need to invest, but this not depends on the money. I think that depends more, more than the attitude of the governments and the offerings. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's like say Simon with one of the samples, if you uh, have a architecture, okay, you have a regulation that say that the main ent entrance you need uh, access for everybody and no steps. It is yes. the, the infrastructure has the same cost, it's aptitude. And I, I think that we have to change the, the main. Okay, yeah. Access, accessibility is for everybody. I always say the same is for everybody. Yeah, uh, it, the, the cost differential when designed from the beginning is less than a half a percent cost difference. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's uh, not, not doing it is inappropriate, ineffective, and inefficient. Um, and in fact, there's some really good examples of um, precincts in different countries. So for example, Thailand have done some extraordinary accessible resort work. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, a, a, a country, another country, and even though they're, you know, they are in good commas, the other country, some absolutely fantastic um, access in older heritage uh, countries. Uh, Italy's got some absolutely brilliant uh, resorts in areas that are quite, you know, quite old areas uh, because they've, when they've done redevelopment, they've had the right standards in place. Um, and so you're, you know, creating these new areas. I think the big problem is regulating the private sector in, in countries to actually do what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, uh, and, and that's why I think the convention as a human rights instrument and the international standards organization providing exemplary uh, practice uh, based on you know, the, the, the best design features in the world now, um, there's an opportunity not to get these things continually wrong. Yes, uh, I do agree. I think I think uh, one statement that you have mentioned, Prof. Simons, that it is all about enabling, not only just about enabling environment, but it's also about the attitude, the positive attitude towards it. I think when, when you have the positive, a positive attitude towards it, even from the early design process, you already plan, in fact, this accessibility. Yeah, and, and also, and also, um, uh, most people with disability don't expect utopia. So when things aren't quite right, if you've got a good manager, you can make some things work, even though they're not perfect, through good management and a positive uh, and good training uh, within managers. So, um, you know, I've, I've gone to a lot of places that haven't been uh, perfect but I've had a very good time because we're able to make them work with some little changes. Sometimes taking a door off means that you can actually get through the door <laughs> yes. um, rather than uh, come to a destination and go, oh my God, it's just not going to work. You uh, good managers will make things work. Yes. All right. I think I think that is a good point. Uh, sometimes uh, just uh, to 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 have the good managers, the just simply by having a good manager to put that thing about the accessibility is is already sufficient without even having the expensive uh, 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 investment to ensure an accessibility. I think by this, I think we can uh, wrap up uh, the sessions. Okay, that's, I think I think this is really a great session just to see the 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 how is the future of tourism industry 
from the point of view of people with disability, which is I think not so many people think about it. I think I really, uh, I really, really appreciate the sharing by uh, both uh, of the uh, this is amazing speakers by Prof. Simons and Dr. Trinidad, and uh, also with the a lot of uh, uh, really a uh, detail uh, uh, and uh, uh, comprehensive data that Dr. Trinidad presented that, that hopefully with this uh, uh, research, uh, this uh, show of people that many things, many works actually still need to be done in the tourism industry to be more access, to be more accessible, like in fact, for pro uh, people with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much also for all the attendance and uh, I would like actually to pass the floor back to Dr. Rupam. Thank you so much. Thank you very Bye. much, uh, Dr. Kamaria. Thank you very much, Prof. Tasi, and also Dr. Trinidad for interesting sharing for ours, uh, all the participants. Next, uh, I would like all our participants to give a quick feedback. How did you like this session? You can just quickly scan the QR code on your screen and you can just use one word to give a feedback about how do you like this session. So I'll pause for a while in this particular screen and then we will go to the group session photo. Okay, moving forward, we will ask uh, Ms. Sophina if you can help me to take a digital group photo of with the participant along with the speakers. I will stop sharing here. Ms. Sophina, can you able to hear me? Okay. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and then direct the participants. Okay, maybe I can assist you to take a quick photo. All right, so everybody, please open up your camera and we'll go on the page number one, one, two, three. All right, page number two, one, two, three. Make sure you open your camera and give a big smile. Page number three, one, two, three. Right, thank you everybody for, for joining this session. We really appreciate that. Uh, please don't go. We have another session. The last session of our second grade summer school will be coming up at 4 p.m. So uh, until then, we will be back uh, let me share my screen. Right, so we will be back at four o'clock. Uh, so we'll still have 20 minutes. Uh, grab a quick snack or tea, coffee, whichever you want. And we will see you very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, all the thank speakers. Thank you, Prof. Simon, and thank you, Dr. Trinidad. Thank you, Dr. Camellia. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Camilla, for uh, facilitating. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof.
welcome. Come on in. So welcome to the Vortex XR Lab. So let me talk to you a bit about the XR stage. So from here, you can see basically there's green screens. There's an LED screen. There's like other screens. There's a huge camera over here. So what this does is basically put us within the virtual world. As you can see from the screens above, oh, wow. I'm actually there within the virtual world. And you can see there, that's called the parallax effect because we have like trackers on the camera and on the ceilings and stuff. So the Vortex XR Lab is open for both teachers and students as well. So this basically opens up a whole different possibilities of teaching and learning. Imagine like lecturers, teachers utilizing this, you will be in a different, different world. All right, let's go to the immersive space where virtual reality and mixed reality experiences happen. As you can see, we have three rooms for three different separate uh, experiences. We also utilizing the high-end workstations over here for teachers and learners basically to utilize VR within their, their, their teaching and learning. It is a PC-based VR which has like sensors and a controller. Basically, you can utilize the controller to interact with anything. It has a mic and because it's multiplayer, we have like other users can join in. You can actually see this in action within the virtual world. I'm about to join him online. I mean, virtually. So this is the Microsoft HoloLens. It is a mixed reality device. Unlike virtual reality where you are totally inside a different world, this one brings the digital world to us. 